Welcome to Theories and Problems in Visual Art. This is Lecture H13, History Lecture 13, on Theories of Contemporary Art. I'm going to talk first about the idea of the contemporary and a couple of other words that are used along with it, like contemporaneities, notoriously hard word to pronounce and spell. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about a theory that contemporary art actually divides into three strands or modes. So first of all, the idea of the contemporary. Contemporary art, technically speaking, it can't be a period because contemporary art should pertain to any artist in any culture at any time. Contemporary is just what's present. Uh, it's the sliver of time that we live in. It's the atmosphere in which the work is made. But in the art world, contemporary art has increasingly seen, been seen as something that comes after postmodernism, as if it's the beginning of a new period. All the many institutions with the word contemporary in their names, the contemporary art museums, uh, are evidence of this idea that they represent something, that they'll exhibit something that's after postmodernism. So there's a fundamental conceptual tension there between the contemporary in its kind of literal nominal sense as the present and also the contemporary as an aspirational period, something that might become a period. A couple of writers have proposed uh, a distinction between the contemporary and contemporaneity. Contemporaneity would refer to the awareness that you're related to contemporary art, artists, and ideas. Um, so that's a useful word, even if it's a bit polysyllabic. The contemporary refers to what's in the present, the time in which we live. But people tend to talk about the contemporary when they, are, when they mean to say uh, interesting current art. Um, so the contemporary, uh, if you're talking about art, is a way of talking about art that's present, in, done in the present, but it's more engaging uh, or more interesting than work that seems old-fashioned but still being done in the same year. Talking about contemporary that way makes it again into something that's like a period. Your art can be part of the contemporary. You could participate in the contemporary, but someone else's some other students' arts made at the same time may not be part of that conversation, the contemporary. It would be clearer if people in the art world use the expression the present to refer to our year, but that's not what most people do. They use this word contemporary and contemporaneity also in this ambiguous way to talk about something that might be a period or might be just present, might be part of the present, or might be the whole present. Even though it is polysyllabic, this word contemporaneities is useful uh, because there could be more than one contemporaneity in any given time. The galleries in a large city will show a range of works that could belong to different decades, even though they're all made in the same year. These are just a couple images that I pulled off uh, Instagram. Cindy Sherman, one of Cindy Sherman's um, digital self-portraits, um, and something by an artist named Sergei Kurbatov, who I don't otherwise know, um, who's representing here a uh, conservative tradition in watercolor landscape painting which is also being done at the same time as work like Cindy Sherman. So these are contemporary neities, um, both done at the same time. So the plural contemporary neities um, is useful also because uh, it's possible that our time might be unusual in the history of art in that there's not just one contemporary neity, but there are plural contemporary neities then. So the condition of art making in the present is that we're living with multiple contemporaneities, as any art school shows. There are many different strands that can, can be assigned to different historical periods and different frames of reference that are all running at the same time. That's just a screenshot from a, from a company that's actually called contemporaneities.com, contemporary art exhibitions. Temporalities are time frames. They're cultural contexts that move at different speeds. So things can be more current in large cities and smaller cities and towns can lag behind. I, I'm illustrating this with a map of um, internet penetration into different um, uh, countries, um, which creates a distorted uh, map of the world if you, if you do it proportionally to area. So this would represent in general um, parts of the world that are, can be more current in relation to some things and ones that are likely to have um, areas that lag behind. So the idea of temporalities is that it's as if uh, different regions of the world have clocks that run at different speeds. 
This is an idea that was first developed in political theory by writers like Harry Haratunian, who is a specialist on uh, Japan, Japanese politics and history. Temporalities is um, a formal word to describe something that everybody knows intuitively, and that is the closer you are to some center or to connection to the internet or, or to social and social connections, the more likely you're to be, you are to be like at the cutting edge of things. If you go back in time a little bit, temporalities become much more clear than they are now. Uh, so here's an example of a time lag of that sort. Um, so the first Impressionist exhibition in France was 1874, but um, Impressionism first appeared in Brazil much later. Um, this is a, painter by, a painting by Georgina uh, de Albuquerque, died in 1962. She was a Brazilian Impressionist who moved to Paris in 1906. At that point, in 1906, French painting had already moved on to post-Impressionism, past post-Impressionism, to Fauvism and other styles, um, but uh, she wasn't educated um, in some of those um, more radical styles of that year, 1906, and so she brought um, Impressionism back to Brazil much later than it had been practiced in Paris. That's typical uh, of that period, 19th century, 20, early 20th century, happened all around the world. Now, we would measure temporalities usually in just fractions of a second, having to do with internet speed and access and so on. But there are still uh, many parts of the world that are very isolated, despite the rhetoric um, that's common in the first world about how we're all connected. Large parts of Africa have effectively no internet. Parts of Central Asia are like that, um, that are even more cut off than they were before the breakup of the Soviet Union. So there is um, a bit of obliviousness about the persistence of quite different temporalities in the art world, a, a bit of obliviousness uh, because of the fact that most of the international art world is um, international and uh, people in it travel widely and there are biennales all over the world, um, but that can disguise the fact that temporalities of this kind still exist. These different temporalities of the, of the, more, of the stronger kind were around until the end of the 20th century. And they are vanishing, um, but at the same time, they continue to exist in the present. And it's something that's not acknowledged as much by the art world as it is by um, art historians, anthropologists, and others um, who travel outside art world circles. So three strands of contemporary art. This is a theory uh, that was proposed by the Australian art historian Terry Smith. Um, he's also the author of probably the most widely read attempt to define the contemporary, which is mostly in this book, What is Contemporary Art from 2009? Um, and he uses the word contemporaneities to describe these quote unquote currents or strands or modes of contemporary art. Terry Smith's first current is globalization. That is art that's visible internationally in contemporary art institutions. And he divides um, globalization, the stream or the current of globalization in contemporary art into two styles. The first one he calls retro sensationalism. And that's when artists try to be contemporary by embracing capitalism instead of resisting it, um, like earlier generations of postmodernists and modernists. And the second one he calls remodernism. That's when institutions promote artists as contemporary, even if they might not be. So I'll give an example of this. Retro sensationalism uh, includes artists who embrace globalizing capital and neoconservative politics. And, and Smith includes the YBAs, Young British Artists, and also artists like Takashi Murakami, who you see at the left, um, who uh, has uh, partnered with Vuitton and done other commercially oriented and engaged kinds of, um, kinds of art projects. Um, Retro sensationalism would also include artists like Damien Hirst, especially his show in Venice from 2017, uh, where he took over a number of buildings in Venice to show uh, an enormous exhibition that was full of um, supposedly Baroque um, qualities presented as contemporary art. That's the, that's the bottom part of a, of a colossal bronze statue that was the centerpiece of um, Damien Hirst's exhibition, and it, it has this Baroque quality of monumentality. He had a number of large uh, sculptures in it, and so that, those are also Baroque quality, scale, 
dynamic composition. These are, these are qualities that you could read in your art history textbook about the Baroque. And um, Damien Hirst's project here is retro sensationalist, um, partly because uh, retro modernist, retro sensationalist, because it um, embraces these and tries to bring them up into the 21st century. At the same time, it's very um, commercial, so it fits Terry Smith's um, uh, definition. Some other, a couple of other scenes from that uh, exhibition. In the Baroque, in the 17th and 18th century, there was also um, a growing fascination with natural processes, uh, natural history, um, and uh, in this case, decay and uh, uh, of, of sculptures that were supposedly found at the bottom of the ocean. And it's also very Baroque to be interested in drama and theater. Uh, I think I should say that none of these qualities that I've just been naming are unambiguously Baroque. They're most of them part of an idea of the Baroque that can be found in 20th century art history textbooks. So actually Damien Hirst is influenced directly or indirectly by 20th century art history textbooks more than he is by the Baroque. But that's not important to Terry Smith's classification because this is retro modernist in his way of, um, in his way of thinking. Um, it revives an earlier style and represents it as something that belongs to the contemporary and at the same time it's deeply engaged with capitalism and marketing. The second quote unquote style of globalization is remodernism and Terry Smith describes that as quote the constant efforts of contemporary art museums to renovate or revive modernist art. For example Richard Serra, Gerhard Richter who you see at the left doing one of his abstract paintings by dragging a board across his canvas, uh, and Jeff Wall. So these are artists of a particular generation uh, that are repeatedly re-canonized as contemporary artists. Art in this current quote comes across as late modern art that is half aware of its conservatism and quote continues to pursue the key drivers of modernist art, reflexivity and avant-garde experimentality. I like the idea that it's half aware, people like Richard Serra, um, aware of the fact that they are modernist icons, that they were that way um, in the 70s um, and 80s um, in the 20th century, um, and that now they've been re-canonized, repeatedly re-canonized um, as contemporary uh, in Terry Smith's way of thinking about things. He says that art of this kind has to be, quote, relentlessly presented as contemporary in order to work. The second current, he says, emerges from the process of decolonization within what were the second, third, and fourth worlds, including its impacts in what was the first world. It has not coalesced into an overall art movement or two or three broad ones. Rather, the post-colonial turn has generated a plethora of art shaped by local, national, anti-colonial, independent values, diversity, identity, critique, and it has enormous international currency through travelers, expatriates, new markets, and especially biennales. And here he names uh, a number of artists. Um, I've written down some of them there. Um, and they, artists of this kind, it, within this part of the second current, uh, decolonial art um, and artists interested in, in um, uh, decolonization in general, um, comprises the principal number, the main number of visiting artists in art schools and academies. Uh, in a large art school, like the School of the Art Institute, most of the artists that will um, be invited to come and speak uh, or for residencies will come from this group among Terry Smith's different, um, three different uh, streams. The third current, the last of Smith's ideas of uh, what's happening in the contemporary, is a kind of miscellaneous grouping of younger artists, that's what he says, intervening in the, quote, image economy often in small scale ways, as a reaction against the monumentality of the first current, I should probably say the first two currents. Um, and they have a quote, fading interest in power structures and styles of struggle, in Terry Smith's uh, opinion. He says, artists in this group want to grasp the changing nature of time, place, media, and mood today. That's a Trevor Paglin photograph, one of his photographs from a, from a great distance of a, of a uh, military installation. Um, that he couldn't get uh, close to. So Smith doesn't name any, any artists in this stream. Uh, it may not be a coherent stream. Uh, for example, he 
could mean people like Trevor uh, Paglin or Francis Tsang, Zach Blass, that, who's, who did this video, and a number of others. I don't think this third strand image economy art, as he calls it, is particularly um, useful classification. Um, and in fact, um, not many people have taken Terry Smith on board with his idea that uh, contemporary neities include mainly these three strands. Uh, but the first two of them are actually quite useful. Here they are in a list. So there's globalization, which he divides into retro sensationalism and remodernism, and then there's decolonial art in general, and then this third category, which is not as convincing because it's too uh, miscellaneous. But it seems to me um, interesting that so few people have tried to do this. It's very hard to classify, organize, uh, or periodize the present. Um, so not many people sort of step up and give it a, a try. But it's also interesting because uh, these first two really do correspond to visible groupings or contemporaneities uh, within the present. Um, so it is uh, interesting and useful to think about how you would um, gather or group or classify art that's happening in the present. If you ask yourself, is my art contemporary, there's a couple different ways that you could answer. You could say, uh, maybe not, if you find yourself drawn to artists and ideas from the past or from other temporalities, from places the, where the clocks move at different speeds. And this is a very common thing. It sounds at first, if I say it this way, maybe it's like a not a good thing, but it's uh, absolutely the way the art world works. In fact, um, uh, in accord with um, theorizations of the contemporary and its multiplicities, um, it's actually part of the nature of our time uh, that there are multiple contemporaneities. Um, so it's actually not at all uh, a quote unquote bad thing to be uh, interested in artists and ideas uh, from outside the contemporary or contemporaneities. You might not be uh, contemporary if you're not especially connected to any of the current conversations or communities like those um, three streams in, in Smith's, um, um, in Smith's uh, theory because uh, there are many other things to be interested in and you might not be part of communities that are talking about those questions. So that would be a way of thinking that you maybe, maybe your art is not contemporary in this sense. But also, your art can definitely be contemporary um, and in, a, in some ways necessarily is because you're aware of multiple communities like the ones I've been talking about, like the ones all around us uh, in the art world, in the, in the art school and art community. And all of these together comprise contemporary practice. One of the things that you can learn in art school, one of the reasons to go to an art school is to become fluent in these different languages, these contemporaneities, uh, because they are themselves the nature of contemporary art. 